PhD and working uh, also with Christian Gatar on the um, uh, bioinformatics and uh, yeah, at, like in, in, involved in several uh, large scale projects that you're going to talk to us about. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, how long do I have, by the way? About half an hour? Something like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, bear with me. I haven't actually spoken on this project yet because it's pretty new. Um, so, timing might be rough, but uh, we'll get through it. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, going to talk to you guys today about uh, this project I kind of started uh, this summer um, that's uh, basically evaluating the stability of different neuroimaging pipelines um, and trying to get at uh, essentially how much we can trust the results we're getting. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of a, you know, just overview or introduction to, um, you know, the reproducibility crisis, at least the part of it that I'm caring about. Um, talking about how we can kind of operationalize this term of stability and get at evaluating it. And then we're going to evaluate a pipeline. Um, so uh, many of you have probably seen this paper. Um, it's published in 2015 by the Open Science Collaboration, which was started by Brian Nosek. And they basically said that, you know, they took 100 studies. These are the original really reported p-values, where this line is 0.05. And in their attempts to replicate, these are the p-values they got for those studies. Turns out, most of the time, you can't replicate things. Um, I believe they found a success rate of about 30%, 33% or so they were able to replicate. Um, the remaining um, two thirds, they weren't able to. And what you also see is, you know, with effect size over here, you also see the effect size um, is often um, kind of inflated in the original studies as opposed to replication attempts. So are, are they like a neuroimaging studies? Oh, so these are, sorry, these are uh, psychology studies. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of the introduction. This is the big, like, first super sexy example that made the news of reproducibility might be a problem. We should start being a little more careful. Um, so there's many cases of this in uh, neuroimaging as well. So this is an example done by uh, Tristan and a student of his, um, where all we're doing is we're switching between two versions of the CentOS operating system and running the HTTP pipeline on the same subject. So that again, same data set, same tool, same parameters, same computer hardware. All we're doing is changing CentOS 6 and 7. And the flicker is the difference between the segmentations you get, which is a bit scary when you think about, say, like you care about you know, something in your cortical surface, cortical thickness. That's going to give you a significantly different answer, depending on just what version of CentOS you picked. So that's a bit scary. So that can be one contributing factor, operating system. So another thing could be, you know, another thing causing these reproducibility issues might be data quality. So this is um, a study that was done on the Abide data set, where essentially um, they were trying to discriminate uh, between healthy controls and autistic, um, autistic participants. The study on the left was published a year before this one by Buddha, who's in Allen Evans' lab. And they basically found um, no relationships, or sorry, no differentiating factors between these two classes. But when Buddha did much more strict quality control and threw out basically two thirds of the data set, leaving only high quality data, they found um, many differences between these populations. So, okay, we have operating system that can cause differences, and we also potentially have, you know, data quality. Think of something else. So, this was work done by Lindsay Lewis, also in Allen's lab, where what she did was she took a civet pipeline and a free surfer pipeline, had them estimate cortical surfaces. Then at one voxel in the corpus callosum, she increased the, the intensity by 1%. So again, one voxel by 1% intensity in the corpus callosum and re-estimated cortical surfaces. And where you see green, it is no change from the reference or very small change. Um, blue is deflation and um, red is inflation. So both using free surfer and civet, we see a lot of changes here. Um, and sorry, what's the measure? <coughs> sorry? Is the metric? What is the metric? The um, cortical thickness? It's the distance in millimeters from the original cortical surface. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we do see, and again, this is uh, the blue is 0.1, and this is 0.1 uh, as well. So, um, so again, in either case, we see a surprising amount of deviation considering one voxel in white matter was changed by so little um, to have these significant differences. So per perhaps there's kind of underlying instabilities um, in the tools that are also causing these um, reproducibility issues. Sometimes, however, these instabilities can actually be anticipated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, just like uh, out of curiosity, 
if you if you don't uh, increase by one percent, do you get the same result? You know, the terms are there, some randomized. Is it deterministic? Processes? Yeah. So um, I believe random seeds were fixed, and these were made to be deterministic pipelines um, for the sake of this evaluation. So two runs without any noise, you get the same answer. Then the second run, where you add a tiny bit, you do get a different answer. Um, so, uh, so in some cases, we're actually able to anticipate instabilities. So this was a paper published in 2000 by Scare and colleagues, um, where essentially they took, looked at different tensor models that you can use for reconstructing diffusion signals. Um, they analytically computed the condition number, which is essentially a measure in, uh, used in numerical analysis for evaluating how stable a function is. Then they plotted the condition numbers with the, against the observed variance um, for, uh, for many of these um, different uh, models they tried. And if you look at some of them here, you see that over the parameter space of you know, the direction of the tensor that they're modeling, um, you can see much more variance to, or much more sensitivity to noise at different parts in these functions. So not only are functions, not only are algorithms differently unstable from one another, um, they may be differently unstable over the space that you're observing them. Does that make sense? So, it's great. So we can see, you know, operating system, maybe I know to look for that. You know, data quality, maybe I know to look for that. Algorithmic choice, you know, maybe I know to use potentially more stable algorithms or, um, or evaluate ones when I can. But what about the stabilities we see in practice that we didn't necessarily think to expect? So for instance, addition in Python, you will notice this. So if you simply take, I make this little function where all this is doing is counting to one. I give it a number n, I make a step size that is one over n, and then I just add that number n times. Seems simple enough. And again, I print out just the step size and the step times the number of n just to verify that, you know, by multiplying this, we get the right answer. So for the number five, it works wonderfully. For the number 1,000, the step size is what we expect. The multiplication is what we expect. But all of a sudden, our addition is not the right answer anymore. Does anyone know just offhand why this is happening? So obviously this is a bit surprising, um, and uh, the reason is actually just because floating point data is finite. So it ha just so happens, you know, in decimal we can't represent one fraction cleanly. We do dot three 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 until we get tired of writing threes. Well, the number point one in decimal is also you know a repeating decimal. Um, so this is you know the structure of floating point values. So they are finite. You have a float on the top and you have a double here, and um, and basically what this means is that when you're doing floating point arithmetic, you will be inexact just because of the limitations of the data structures we have and the fact that computers, again, are finite machines. So whoa, what happened there? Mm -hmm. That slide got moved. Okay. Um, I'll have to jump back up to it later. But uh, right, so floating point arithmetic is inexact. And I'll make a quick demonstration of that here. Simply doing addition um, is not associative. So if you have, you know, this number 2000 and you add negative 1998 to it, and then you add 1.333, the order in which you do that, assuming that you only have, you know, these four digits to work with, will change the answer. Because if you do this addition first, you'll end up with 2.000 plus 1.333 and you'll get three with repeating threes. Whereas if you do it in this order first, you're going to essentially, you, again, you only have four digits to represent this. You're going to lose all of these threes and then your final answer will be 3.0. So which is the right answer? Okay, so I agree from looking at this, the top one feels like the right answer. But we actually don't know because the problem is here, we also have you know, truncation. We don't know what the, is behind the decimal points in these values. So all of these are non-significant digits. We don't know if they're re really zeros or not. So there's essentially two types of, um, of floating point error that we can, we can have in arithmetic. This is called catastrophic can cancellation. So here we have four significant digits. You know, both of these numbers have four digits that are meaningful. We do their, uh, we do addition between them, and now we have one digit that's meaningful. So this is again cancellation, and then here we have round off error, where basically we have to truncate to, to the sp space that we have to work with, and here again we lose this information. So these, so these are the two types of um, error that are introduced in every floating point operation that we use. <laughs> so the, what this leads us to think is, okay, if these errors are being introduced all the time, 
and we're losing information, we don't necessarily know what's behind you know, our last digit, could we perhaps leverage this to, um, to essentially simulate, okay, what if it rounded up instead of down that time? And we can essentially leverage these instabilities um, to, um, to simulate you know, the, uh, having higher precision in our data. So this is where Monte Carlo arithmetic comes in. So essentially what we're doing is instead of treating our values as exact values on disk, we are recognizing that when we have a value that can't be represented exactly within the number, the amount of precision we have, it is going to be a random variable. So essentially it's the value we have plus at whatever target precision you want. So for instance, the least significant digit, um, it will be <clears throat> with the addition of some random amount of noise where we're basically adding a random variable that's uniformly distributed between negative a half and a half. So it'll essentially 50% of the time cause something to round up that was previously being rounded down and vice versa. That makes sense? So it's literally a 50% probability zero bias um, toggle of the last bit of a number on disk. So, uh, so this is a wonderful tool that implements this. It's called Verify Carlo. Uh, what you're able to do with it is recompile any C, C++, or Fortran library, replacing all floating point operations with Monte Carlo arithmetic. So <laughs> what that means at runtime, so what I'm going to refer to as this entire workflow is MCA, and I'll break down what these two are in a second. Um, but what this uh, boils down to is at runtime, if it's a floating point operation, it will convert floats to doubles and doubles to quads, so basically give you twice as much space to represent your data. It will simulate unrounding, so it'll randomly add that, or well, it'll add that random variable to the end. It will perform the operation. It will round it back down, or simulate rounding it back down, and then convert them back into their original data types. And that's it. So you end up with the data in the same data space you expected it, but essentially what you're doing is you're simulating, if you had more precision, what would happen. So precision bounding is PB. This is when, what happens when you essentially introduce um, this imprecision on the inputs of values prior to doing the operation. And um, random rounding is what happens when you do it on the outputs. So these can be performed independently, um, which allows us to, again, evaluate um, different pieces of the pipeline in general. Uh, random rounding is considered to be a less aggressive form of noise. <coughs> so what we did was we instrumented Python, all libraries we built with Cython, NumPy, Blast, and LaPack, all with fuzzy arithmetic. These have been uh, put in Docker containers. You can download them yourself. You can run a Python where if you do something, you will get a different answer every time just by adding the number 0.1 10 times. Um, <laughs> so uh, you can consume these if you want to do your own fuzzy analyses. Um, and uh, then what we did was we ran a deterministic uh, tractography pipeline with full MCA uh, using the Python and Cython builds, and then the random rounding mode using both the Python mode and the full stack where the full stack essentially means the addition of these three built, uh, being instrumented. Um, <clears throat> the reason why we didn't run full MCA with the full stack is that in NumPy, we encountered a, a, essentially a bug um, where, uh, where whenever we we're trying to initialize a matrix, a value that probably should be represented as an int was represented as a float, and then it forced branching where we ended up in like, essentially a catch case where we would crash deterministically. So I'm not only just as, as a quick tangent, not only is this potentially a way that I'm going to show you can identify instabilities in pipelines, this is potentially also a way to identify bugs um, or, uh, or perhaps poor coding practices in, in software packages. Um, so then we did these three types of noise injection. And then the one voxel noise that I mentioned Lindsay Lewis did with the free surfer maps where she injured one voxel of noise. Uh, we did two versions of this. So since we're doing diffusion data, we did it once per 3D volume. And then we also did another version where we did once for the entire 40 stack. Um, in the 3D volume case, it's not at the same location in all volumes. It is randomly distributed in each, or randomly placed in each volume uh, within a white wonder mask. Then we ran these simulations 100 times each for 10 subjects. Oops, there we go. OK, so um, <coughs> here's what we got. Uh, so the, on the y-axis, we have the percent deviation from our reference. Where again, the reference is the version that we got without injecting any noise into our pipeline. Um, our pipeline was deterministic. So running the same pipeline twice as the reference gave the exact same graph. Then, uh, yeah, so this is the percent deviation uh, where 100% essentially is um, the norm is between the difference of the two is equivalent to the norm um, of the matrix minus the zeros matrix. They're entirely different graphs by, uh, by their weights. X axis, we have subjects. 
and each color is a type of noise. So this interesting peach colored bar up here is the cross subject level difference. So if we took two random subjects in this data set, took their difference, um, we would be in somewhere in here, between 50 and 100 percent different. Um, again, these error bars are, are sorry, the bounds are the first and third quartile from just the difference within this uh, cohort. So terrifyingly, we see that oftentimes for the, the Python implementations, we reach subject level um, deviations. So this is potentially um, a problem. You know, if we're trying to evaluate some claim on our data set, we're trying to say, is there a difference between these two populations or even just these two individuals? And small instabilities where we're just, again, changing the least significant bit on a massive number uh, throughout the course of the pipeline, we end up with deviations that are as you know, considerable as the difference between, <coughs> sorry, within what a person as we get as the difference between different people. That might invalidate some of the claims we're making. Yeah, why is it so quantized? Why is everything 50%? Right, so that's a good point. So one thing that you'll notice is the, um, the green, purple, and orange are quite continuous, right? They're, re they're rather distributed. Whereas in the case of the um, blue and red, we see that we're essentially at modes. And so the reason for this is um, remembering that the MCA and RR Python implementations are only instrumenting arithmetic done by Python itself. Um, so essentially, we, this is a hypothesis we're in the process of testing. But our, our hypothesis is that this is actually due to branching effects. So what happens is, you know, throughout the course of, uh, let's say, this green version, the full MCA analysis, what we have is every single operation is being, you know, perturbed a tiny bit. But since there's zero bias, all these things can potentially average out to about no change. The law of large numbers. In the case of the uh, just Python implementations, we essentially introduce bias and then let NumPy run away with it, let the scripts run away, this error can cascade, and then we have other branch points. So essentially what, we're, what we believe this is doing is it's essentially doing critical branch points detection. Um, where again, we see that in this case, I believe there are five or six modes. Um, in some others, there's fewer. Um, but in either case, what we're doing is we're just diverging, cascading, and then essentially have more of these decisions. Does that make sense? So what we can kind of take away from this is that, well, again, this is a deterministic pipeline. You know, part of the um, goal of probabilistic pipelines is to mitigate some of these issues. Um, but we are seeing individual differences that are comparable to individual level variation, um, which may, again, be problematic. And what we probably want to look at next is what is the structure of these differences? Um, <clears throat> so what do these changes actually look like? So this is just one example. Um, one that I actually didn't talk about right here was this, this green graph for our second subject here. Um, notice with, uh, again, the blue and reds, across subjects, it's all relatively consistent. Again, every, every time we're getting something as potentially considerable as subject level noise for one of the modes. And then if we quickly jump down to one voxel, single and independent, we see, you know, again, relatively small variation, um, but it's pretty consistent across subjects. If we look at the full stack, um, our, our version, we see that sometimes we have no variation, other times we have a little bit, and in a couple cases, we have huge amounts of variation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna single in on this one right here and look at, see what does this variation look like. <clears throat> so on the top left, we have the graph where there's no change, essentially at the bottom of that distribution, and at the bottom right, um, we have the, um, that one near the top of that distribution where the entire graph is, is different. Um, so what we can kind of see here, as we go across this table, is we more or less see like a systematic collapse um, of this pipeline. We see that, um, you know, the left hemisphere in this connectome, this is using the Descan Atlas, um, basically just fades out of existence. Again, starting here, there's no change. We start to see connections missing more and more and more. And once that essentially hemisphere is completely gone, the rest of the graph follows. But in this case, we're seeing just a collapse of the pipeline where, for whatever reason, the data, again, as we're you know, introducing this noise, the data is not being tracked as effectively in this hemisphere. <coughs> so then, this is where the takeaway two disappeared. Um, I'll jump back up to it. So <laughs> in this case, the deviations that we're observing are somewhat structured. We see, again, like a progression between these deviations. 
Um, so that leads us to think, okay, what is, you know, let's look at this for all the subjects. What is a more um, kind of full overarching way to, to view this? So again, we have our subjects on the X, we have our noise methods on the Y, and the intensity is essentially the relative standard deviation um, of a given edge, where edges that exhibit exactly no standard deviation have been put into the background. If we have red, we see increases. If we have blue, we see decreases. <coughs> so first of all, we see that in the RR full stack case, generally our edges are decreasing. So maybe in this case, what, what this noise is showing us is that across the samples we tested, we seem to have kind of a collapse of these pipelines. Our tracking doesn't seem to be, um, to be holding up. Whereas in the case of these RR um, and uh, MCA Python implementations, we're actually seeing an increase in edge weight. For the one voxel single and independent, um, we see both an increase and decrease. Uh, it's hard to see um, from a projector, but, uh, but there's red and blue scattered here. And in general, as we saw with the other graphs, the deviations are much less, um, much less significant. But what this leads us to believe is that, or, or conclude, is that both, you know, we can see that these can be bidirectional. We can see collapses and also increases, um, but it's highly data dependent. You know, we aren't necessarily getting, uh, when we're evaluating a tool, we aren't necessarily getting a tool stability evaluation. We're getting a joint combination of this tool on this data set evaluation. And that's something that's important to consider. So, okay. Now the question is, Greg, you've shown us lots of instabilities. You've demonstrated that these pipelines may be doing things that we don't necessarily expect, but can we do anything with that? So the next thing we tried was aggregating. So, you know, simply we could take the mean of all our graphs um, that we got from all of these simulations and say, great, here's a new graph, use this one. And so what I have here is on the bottom half of this uh, Y axis, we have the number of missing edges um, just binary score, and on the top half, we have the number of newly added edges based on each of these aggregation techniques, where again, we have the mean, the min, 10th percentile, median, 90th percentile, and max. Um, I'll explain the last column in a second. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, unsurprisingly, we see that when we're taking the mean, we are never losing, an, we're never losing any edges, which of course is the case. As soon as you have an edge weight greater than one, it's brought into the aggregate. So this could be a potentially uh, interesting way to increase, uh, again, the, the density of our networks. When we're taking the minimum, of course, there's a few examples here where we are losing considerable number of edges. And again, of course, that goes less as we're going uh, further, further in terms of our threshold. Where again, the percentile we're taking here is we're saying of all of the edge weights we have for this location, um, take the, the minimum one, the maximum one, or a percentile in the middle. So the nice thing with aggregating in methods like this is we can also do things like identify which edges are the most volatile. So in this case, we took, I believe, the 90th percentile and subtracted the minimum. And we basically said, Let, show me all the edges that are maybe, I think it was the 100th actually, percentile minus the minimum. And we say, show me all the edges that appear, but not all the time. Basically remove the ones that are super stable and show me what's left. So then you can have, again, a volatility graph um, for connections that maybe you want to hone in on more or understand where your algorithm is, uh, is being, uh, again, less stable. So the next steps of this project, well, so first of all, um, so again, aggregation may be a way to um, create more stable estimates uh, or derivatives, um, but also give us estimates of their variance. And the next place this is going um, is to actually validate the, or to evaluate the validity of these graphs. So I've just kind of shown you a bunch of quantitative metrics, like these graphs are, you know, 50% different. They have fewer edges, more edges, what have you. Um, so the next step is collaborating with uh, Ariel Rokum and Bratislav Misic to evaluate the validity of fibers and graphs, respectively, um, based on, you know, kind of community accepted um, standards. And um, so again, this is, I've, you know, I've talked about a lot, uh, sorry, a lot about, you know, the significance of these differences, but we don't actually know how much that will impact, you know, a typical analytical experiment or result. And that's what's in progress. <coughs> so just in summary, um, kind of what I, what I showed in this work is that minor perturbations, again, switching the smallest bit of numbers through the pipeline um, can introduce or, or highlight instabilities that we have. Now, one the limitation of this is that the stability analyses are inseparably evaluating the tool and the data that's being applied on. We can't again, separate which one we're evaluating. The way to do that would essentially 
um, again, potentially aggregate stability scores over a wide range of data sets. Um, and then finally, the analytical impact of these instabilities is, uh, is currently being evaluated. So all the code, um, again, the Docker containers, the pipeline, everything like that I've mentioned is all on GitHub. Um, and you can you know, find it or, or bug me for it. Um, <coughs> and uh, just uh, as a quick invitation, um, Brain Hack Global is happening in December, and I want to extend this kind of software suite and environments to have more tools that we can test. So please join me on this Fuzzy Pipelines project. Um, and then just quick acknowledgments to a bunch of people who helped me all the way. And that's it. Uh, you talked about <coughs> differences when you ah. use different OS. Yeah. Uh, could you identify the origin of those differences? Is it the same as for the like, error in Python? Is it like? Uh, yeah. So what's probably? Uh, I mean, it's one of those uh, differences. It's much harder to track because it's based on the system libraries that are being installed. Um, so what it really comes down to is versions of different system libraries, um, and. Uh, and so essentially, while I showed in one of these figures here, I do have a cross OS um, error bar, again, where it's just all I did was I ran this pipeline also on Ubuntu and on Alpine Linux, um, and just got a distribution of the, uh, of the differences there. Um, but what we found is that it's quite impractical to identify differences in OS, um, because it, is coming, it does come down to a system library. And ultimately, the point isn't to identify, oh, we should freeze this version of this system library. Um, it's more, how can we build our tools such that they're robust to these really, what should be insignificant changes. Um, so I don't know the exact libraries that are causing this, but we're trying to have an approach that's more from the tool development side. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, but, so it, it like, uh, boils down to approximations done in those libraries? Right, exactly. It's, it's approximations. It's, Data types being used, it's rounding strategies, okay. um, things like that. So how how much of this can be mitigated by containers? Um, so the so that's an interesting point. So containers um, is actually well how we tested this first of all. Um, but the problem of you know using one operating system or one container, it's not actually fixing the instabilities in our pipeline. If anything, it's just kind of sweeping it under the rug and that we're saying we will only use this operating system, we will only use this version. Um, so that doesn't actually solve the problem. If anything, it, again, we're, it gives us a false sense of security because we think our tools are stable because we're fixing all these variables. Whereas you know, what we're showing is the instability is also highly data dependent. Um, so it's not actually fixing the problem. Again, if, if anything, it allows us, the containers are great because they allow us to test this um, more flexibly where I don't have to compile you know, a supercomputer's um, uh, you know, Python to be <laughs> fuzzy, um, but I can use my own fuzzy build on those computers as well. Um, so, I mean, following up on the Francois question about you know, what, like, what, where, what is your strategy for uh, tackling the problems? So you mentioned that it's more the, on the tool development aspect. And speaking of that, uh, are you like, um, like, Suggesting that you know, like more unit tests uh, would be implemented and like more, more like sensitive ones because ultimately, if all those issues are covered by unit tests. Then, um... Right. So I think part of the issue with, I mean, unit testing, of course, is great and would be wonderful if people could make realistic unit tests. Um, but the problem is making realistic unit tests is hard. Um, so, for instance, making a test that's robust to one voxel of noise that should be irrelevant. Um, it's, it's a difficult test to, to make. So I think what, what um, we're kind of proposing is the kind of the first step is understanding where, again, what is the significance of these, of these instabilities? Um, and then, then, then there's kind of two paths we're going down for the next step. So one, can we aggregate results in such a way that we still get um, you know, feasible connectomes, feasible graphs or maps or what have you um, that, that are more stable just by, the, by nature of aggregating? Um, but also the other one is, can we identify, um, again, sources within pipelines where these are introduced? And the way we're planning to do that um, primarily is um, imagine you have a pipeline composed of five distinct steps. You inject instabilities throughout the entire pipeline, evaluate the difference at the end. Then you hold the derivatives fixed yeah. after stage one, yeah. stage two, and, and so on. 
and then you can again try and trace back which of these components um, you can you know uh, attribute most of the instability to. And of course, there's limitations of that in that you could go down you know to all the way the floating point operation at each stage and everything like that. So there is some level of resolution that you have to determine is appropriate. So for instance, maybe stopping at registration and you know uh, ODF fitting and tractography and those types of bundles. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's ways that again we're using like that to identify where these sources are coming from. Yeah. So speaking of false sense of security, here is something that is obviously very sensitive to small perturbations. Right. Should we even do experiments that are susceptible to such drastic fluctuations based on a small difference? So here you are trying to eliminate that variability so you don't get these variability with connectome, but sure. doesn't that raise questions about the connectome itself? Doesn't that raise questions about the actual, you know, well, sure. I mean, paradigm that you're using? Right. And I mean, I think there's always going to be a balancing act between are we doing something that we're able to do with the data we have? I mean, again, another example is like, the cortical surfaces, right? Like it's, um, where is it? Way back here. Okay. Right, you see surprising differences on something that we thought we were pretty good at because it's drawing a line on the surface. Like it's not not as hard as, again, tractography where we're crossing fibers and things like this. It's It should be conceptually easier in that a human could, if given enough time, draw a cortical map that would feel good about, or a cortical surface would feel good about rather. So I think that Yes, on well, the one hand, we should try and pick well-conditioned problems and pick things that are we know we're able to solve mathematically, we know will be well-behaved. Um, but at the same time, if we insist on doing things like you know estimating cortical surfaces and tractography, um, we at least need to know how far we're going into this instability space. We need to have a level of variance on our um, on our results, the same way you know you have a p-value on your statistical test, you need to have some level of confidence in your actual derivatives prior to doing the statistical test. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm not. I'm not yeah. questioning what you're doing. Yeah. It's more kind of you know the field we're coming from. We're always facing these things, sure. and then you always think somebody else is doing better, and then you right. say it's like no, actually, yeah. right? It's like everyone is doing poorly, and I think the <laughs> what we need to do is um, again, I think just kind of face this like head on as okay, we can identify a source of instability, like Julian said, or aggregate and see if we can, again, given the state of my tool today, can I just tell users, run it 100 times an average, and then they'll get a better, a better answer at the end of the day? Um, like, what is the right approach? But that's what we're trying to kind of get at here. So, so you mentioned the like neuroimaging pipelines at right. large, and there are a lot of pipelines and tools out there. So um, yeah. you must have encountered um, some tools that did not cause you any problem, and I guess you did not report them here. Or so so what right is, now, what's your approach? And, and yeah. You know? So um, so what I kind of just showed in you on the background side was um, a few other examples where instabilities have been presented, um, and then what I did here was I really like this study was kind of cementing the method for evaluating these instabilities and identifying, you know, are these ways that can show us, like do each of these noise methods or perturbation methods show us something different about our, the way our tools are behaving? Um, so right now I've just done uh, this analysis of the one pipeline I presented. Um, but I mean, there's been other work that Kristal is doing right now that is um, doing motion correction uh, in fMRI using, um, I believe, AFNI, uh, SPM, FSL, and NIAC and is showing that there's a lot of instability there as well, surprise, surprise. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, there's been many more things like this. So the next step, what I'm gonna be working with Ariel, um, is using their new um, AFQ uh, plotting tool and basically switching many of the pipeline components along the way. So how we're doing registration, how we're doing uh, model fitting, how we're doing cryptography, and, and so on. Um, so, so that is kind of the next step. Now that we have this model, let's compare other tools that are in theory of sufficient code quality, because you know all DiPy programs, as an example, are you know written to the same open public standard. They go through the same type of peer review um, as one another, and then see if we can still identify are some algorithms doing better than others, and how important are those differences? Uh, out of curiosity, what's your uh, what's your pipeline? Uh, yes, yeah. what's your tool for creating those pipelines? The tool for creating the pipeline. Like, uh, if you want to test, for example, uh, you know, motion correction across like uh, sure. AFNI, SPM, blah, 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 um, and right. you want to run it, you know, at the time. So, like, because this is, I guess, uh, preceded also by you know, some preprocessing and things sure. like that. 
Yeah, so um, to the software. Or so the pipelines so far have been more or less manually made, just based on um, scientists who do these types of analysis telling us this is a very reasonable benchmark thing to do. Um, so as an example, the, the DiPy tool that I evaluated here is the go-to like getting started with tracking um, pipeline that they that they represent for the sake of that's like when you start using our package, start here. Get, um, so you just run like a series like sequentially yep. scripts and then that you loops across. The, the Basically, platform. yes, um, exactly. Uh, so then again, when it comes to like the motion correction um, as well, it's you know more or less using say um, MC Flirt or or what have you, really whatever the names of the other ones are in the other packages, um, and uh, and again just evaluating those. So we're trying to do as little innovation on the pipeline as possible, just taking kind of pre-built or you know at least pre-documented steps and putting them together. So I'm so not using NiPy um, primarily because um, we're working within, so we're using boutiques for the sake of wrapping these tools. And then there's a tool that I made called Clouder, um, which distributes boutiques workflows uh, to supercomputers and clusters. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and then it records a bunch of provenance information for them. So since we're, let, we're using the system schedulers, um, we didn't think it was particularly advantageous to add NiPy or a workflow engine in the mix. Um, so, uh, so we're pretty much just building these as linear pipelines. Okay. Yeah. So, um, are you looking at the structural connectomes because uh, there is previous work on uh, tractography? Um, I mean, the reason why we chose structural connectomes is simply because that was a domain that we thought you know hadn't got undergone the same amount of a stability analysis as some of the others. It has gone through analysis such as like you know false positives and things like that. Um, but where the cluster failure paper evaluated um, you know SPM, AFNI, FSL for um, their creation of statistical parametric maps and the significance, and where Lindsay's work has done that on structural um, uh, cortical thickness, we hadn't seen that same body of work done in diffusion yet, where it's strictly evaluating not the validity but the stability. Um, so that's kind of what we picked to fusion. But, but introducing the connector model, it doesn't add a layer of complexity on top of tractography that already has uh, its problems. Sorry, does it, doesn't it add a layer of complexity? Because then you have all the choices on how you are actually building uh, your graphs. Sure. While uh, already in tractography, I imagine you will have a lot of problems in terms of what, right. what which perturbations you can induce. Right, okay, so I, I think I understand your question better now. Um, so the reason why we picked connectomes over tracks is that um, connectomes are matrices, which makes it easier to do just quick, non-domain specific evaluations of how much are things changing. Um, I agree that it definitely adds a different component for, for instance, instead of doing um, a certain weighting metric like streamline count or mean FA along the track, if we were to switch that, um, we could have different stability as well. So again, I think that's definitely something that we'll begin to evaluate more um, rigorously as we're testing these pipelines um, and it's like multiple pipelines in this next step. And what are you using as weight? Uh, right now we're using um, fiber count. So number of streamlines. Number of streamlines, yeah. And uh, you are looking at uh, uh, a tensor representation and the uh, uh, single shell uh, data I mentioned? Yes. Okay. And uh, when you mentioned the, the, the fact that now you want to identify the, the more volatile connections, right. you have already an idea of which ones are they, or it's something that you are... Uh, um, I mean, we haven't, uh, I mean, we haven't looked at it from a perspective of we, you know, expect these ones to be more volatile. Okay. Um, we've just simply computed the graphs and looked at what the connections look like. Um, so, I mean, I could visualize them next to each other, I think that would actually but, be a good but illustration. You know now which connections are? Um, I mean, not off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, that's a good note. I'll add a figure um, that shows kind of some of these aggregates. Yeah, even if it's just yeah. something preliminary, just because I won't be curious. Yeah, of course. That's a good idea. Thank you. 